So who got to play slide or was who got to hang out and kill some time on SlideShare Roulette yesterday? Woo! Kevin won back there, guy in a green shirt. Uh, yeah, but uh, if you missed it, you, you missed. What do we want to call that? Just it. it It was it was all kinds of fantastic yesterday. No, we no, uh-uh. So yeah, that was all kinds of fantastic yesterday. We had a great time. Um, so to, today, actually, kind of funny. The lead up uh, yesterday was sort of a lead up to what we're going to do today. So this talk is called uh, "You're Going to Need a Bigger Shovel." It's a critical look at software security assurance. Uh, for those of you that uh, who here works in software, developers, undevelopers. All right, cool. Um, so I don't know if you guys know who I am. My name's Raph. Um, they call me Rabbit. Oh, come on. And I work for uh, HP Application Security, uh, Enterprise Security, and I've been doing some application security stuff. Um, this is how to catch me. I run a podcast. Um, I have a blog, and obviously I'm on Twitter. So we're going, who's got the, uh, the where are the teams of three? One, two, and three. If anybody else wants to play, get a group. Uh, this is going to be a quick exercise. Get a, three people together. Uh, you're just going to have to work sort of together by passing a piece of paper between each other. Anybody else want to play? There's prizes involved. Wow. All right. Yeah, you can play. Here. All right. Yeah, you guys. All right. That's good. You got a paper. All right. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to design a house. Um, there are, you, yeah, Dave, you guys may have already played this. So there's, uh, please don't look at others while you're not sitting close probably enough to anybody to really look at their page. Uh, you can add, remove, or modify anything, but you have to show your work. All right, you have to document, uh, documentation is required for changes, and the answer, if you're going to make a change, you have to define why you made that change. This is, the, uh, this is going to be the front view of the house. And you're going to pass, uh, we're going to do three sets of instructions. After each set, you're going to pass it to the next person, OK? Uh, you're not allowed to talk to each other. This is part of the beauty of this game. OK, ready? Whoever's going to do it first, here we go. So phase one, we're going to draw a two-story house. It's going to have a garage for three cars, and it is a garage right model. So I will give you exactly one minute. Right about this time, I wish I had some Jeopardy music. Wow. That is, as, as the audience spontaneously breaks into whistling Jeopardy theme song for me. That is great. That is, uh, you guys are one of a kind. Special. Special people. Very special people. Ten seconds or so. Okay, as they used to say in uh, Spanish class, pass and loss. Pass it. <laughs> Hi, Adrian. Welcome to the game. All right, so uh, step. So here's the next phase. Ready? We need big windows, a deck off to the side, and lots of lush landscaping. No. <laughs> no, that was last night. <laughs> that, that was uh, HD's other talk. <laughs> yeah, if you were if you weren't there last night, you did miss that as well. Anyway, what's that? I was Simon. I had to be the bad guy. OK. All right. Stop and pass. No, no, Dave, you can't do it twice. You've got to hand it to somebody else completely different. No, you can't. It's my game. It's my rules, Dave. Hand it to that guy, <laughs> who has clearly been paying attention the entire time. All right. La last part here. 
light posts along the driveway, a brick front, and a covered entryway. And Ryan, you want to help me? Uh, you're going to be judge here. So we've got three phases. If, if anybody uh, is catching on yet, if you've ever tried to design any software or uh, put a code spec together, much of what we're doing right now in sort of a rudimentary way is replicated in most development cycles. Uh, the people that do it don't get to talk to each other because they're probably separated by time, language barriers, uh, time zones, and various other things. Uh, it's done in phases. And you never really get, I mean, how clear are these specifications, really, right? Can they be more general? I'd like a house. That's, I think it's the only way I can make this more general. All right, time's up. Um, Brian, grab them for me. There's one over here, one in the back by the guy with the orange, what looks like a Mozilla shirt. With the double thumbs up, that's kind of creepy. Oh, there's, there's one more there. All right, so we'll, we'll take a look at this at the, when, when, we're, when we're done. So here we go. So uh, what type of organization are you, right? If you work in uh, an average enterprise, the t there's basically three types of organizations. There's those that under actually understand software security assurance. That's the small little orange part. There's those, I think, that are pretty much fooling themselves. And then there's those that are randomly spending money on what we call application security on AppSec. Uh, it's an interesting thing to start think about, thinking about. And one of the things that I, I find most fascinating is trying to define software security assurance because there's an evolution here. We, we talked about, uh, for the last number of years, application security. But securing applications doesn't make any sense because there's no context around it. So we talk, the, the sort of methodology and the phrasing around it has changed the software security assurance. Because you really, you know, AppSec, application security, sort of implies that there's going to be, they're going to reach a state of secure. What's the problem with that? It's never going to happen. So what we're going to try to do, we, we're changing the me mentality here, right? What we're going to try to do is provide a state of assurance so you're reasonably secure and reasonably able to trust your software. So that's the difference between software security assurance and, apps, and AppSec. I think what we're trying to get to is a state that's more strategic and less tactical. Less patching, uh, less testing. We had this interesting conversation uh, at OWASP a couple weeks ago in Minneapolis at AppSec USA, and there was a panel that basically involved talking about how we can scan more applications faster, which is an interesting thing to talk about. Because to me, what that sounds like is using a very different uh, analogy from a completely different industry, if I'm going to worry about designing safer cars, and the way I'm going to find and, and build safer cars is, about, is by repeatedly crash testing them. So I'm going to, I've, we've got a car, right? It's gone through all the testing. Nowhere did this, in the specs did it say it has to be safe, but we've gone through all the testing. It's been built, right? It's been designed. It's, everything's working. It's been presented to our customers. They love it. And now they're going to say, okay, by the way, there's this requirement. It has to be safe. So what am I going to do? I'm going to run it into a brick wall. And when it fails, I'm going to keep running into a brick wall, gosh darn it, until it passes. Does anybody feel like that's what they're doing? That's sort of been our tactical approach to application security over the years. We continue to sort of, we're trying to test ourselves secure. And I don't know, but I, we've been at this since what, 98, 97? How's it worked? Not so well? So there's a couple of, couple of tips, a couple of steps we're going to put this into. Step one is always assessment. Know what you're going to start if you're going to build and maintain a security program. Know where you're starting. Where, it's like that uh, where in the world is Carmen San Diego game. Anybody remember that when they were a kid? You had to figure out where, where you are in order to go where you want to go. Right? It's like um, if you've ever pulled up a, a map that's GPS based, that gives you directions to someplace else. You ever, we did it, we ran into this on Thursday as Tom and I were driving from Churchill Downs at a hotel here. 
Uh, my GPS thought we were someplace completely different, and we, we would have gone who only knows where if we had followed those directions, right? We had to figure out where we were so we knew where we were going. And it requires performing what I call a rational assessment of your own capabilities, resources, what kinds of things you have access to in order to build better software. Do you have, does, it, does the organization you work for even have the capacity or capability to build better software? Don't even use the word secure, it's just better software. Can you take the time, can you spend the money, can you get the people trained, get them in-house, do you have the, uh, the liabilities? Do you have all that stuff that you need? Do you have the legal backing? Uh, do you have the organizational and structural components needed for better software? Does your organization have a realistic goal? We've talked to companies that want, that the security team wants to build secure software, but at the management level, they want to be compliant to whatever regulations they have to be compliant to. There's a massive disconnect between those two. And inevitably what ends up happening is their goal is here, your goal is here, and you're pulling in opposite directions. And then we wonder why, why they don't get us, right? Does anybody have a problem with their organization not understanding security? If you didn't raise your hand, then you're lying. Well, that's because you work for yourself, Kevin. If you raise your hand, I would be very, very upset. Okay, I stand corrected. Kevin was not lying. The other thing you have to be careful about is what we, you know the concept of paralysis by analysis. I can't tell you how many organizations take six months to ten months, eighteen months, twenty-four months to figure out what they're going to do, only to realize that by the time they figure out how they want to do it, the landscape of the world has completely changed, and that's the approach is no longer valid. So do a rational analysis, take the time to understand where you are, where you want to go, but don't take two years to do it. The other thing is you have to be uh, thorough and get through everything and understand everything, but move fast, which is sort of an interesting way of looking at things. Plan your resources appropriately. Uh, build resource strategy from your assessment. So take what, you, what you've just learned Take all the things you've just picked up. Say you are a shop of three people of, in IT. The odds of you doing a really thorough, really good software security assurance program is probably fairly low. Maybe your best bet is to just let somebody else handle it for you. The, the caveat and the trap that you can fall into there is a third party doesn't, won't come back and write your source code for you. So always get that balance correct. Right? How can you work with what you've got? Do you have the human technology, time, and uh, capital resources to have a good program in place to be able to do whatever it is your assurance target is going to be? So plan your resource allocation. And when we, you know, we shift from tactical to strategic, you look for 6, 8, 12, 36 months out into the future. You look at where are we going much longer term than just this one app? Because then you fall into that trap of, testing yourself secure. You write some code, it's really, really bad, and then you beat the developers over the head with a baseball bat until, all right, they make it better, and then the next revision, it's like you've never told anybody anything because it's different developers. The app looks completely different, as you'll, as you'll see in just one second here with these beautiful um, drawings. Will you insource, outsource, crowdsource, hybridize, or have aliens code it for you. What, there's gotta be some kind of uh, rationality to it. Can you do it in-house? Can you do all this stuff by yourself? How many of you guys feel confident in assessing applications? Doing an application security assessment? Nobody, somebody? All right. How many of you guys feel then, if you feel comfortable assessing it, how confident do you feel going back and giving them advice on how to fix it? Not just you have cross-site scripting and code everything, because we know that's not the answer, but how, how do you feel about actually going back and structurally telling them how to fix that code? The scary thing is very few security folks that are really good at breaking things can then turn around and say, okay, now let me show you how to fix it. It's a completely different world. But if all we're doing is assessing and generating you know, large amounts of vulnerability data in PDFs that sit on a drive share or on somebody's shelf somewhere, 
we're trying to test ourselves secure. We're going to keep crashing that car until it's much safer than it was last time. And the other thing you have to think about as, uh, as the global sort of economic climate changes in ways that none of us really want at the moment, will your budget increase, decrease? Can you leverage the line of business? That's an interesting question. So can you go back to the company you work for and are you comfortable running a security program without actually having to pay for it? That's really tough. But it's possible and it's doable because if, some, if you can get somebody to care about it much more past the we're going to get hacked, we're going to go out of business if we get hacked, it has to get this fixed right now, the trick is getting to that state. Step three is really intelligent uh, process building. Intelligent process building is the foundation for everything you're going to want to do. If you don't have to reinvent that wheel, absolutely do not, right? You probably don't have to. This is one of the things that I think is foundational to one of, uh, how we uh, really kind of botch up security programs and how we make really bad impressions on companies. If you've ever been the consultant to do a pen test on an app, you walk in, why does everybody give you the death stare? Because they know that you're there to tell them everything they've been doing is crap, it's all wrong. How could they possibly do it this poorly? Why can't you figure this out? It's so easy. Yet, it's really hard. And it's really, really difficult to change mindsets and change methodology. If you're trying to come in and tell somebody to completely change what they're doing, they're going to continue to give you that death stare. There is really no way to change process by revolution. It's got to be an evolution over time. And it's kind of a cliche, but it's very true. Going through and saying, walking into a development organization and saying, everything you've done for the last 15 years, forget it. We're going to do something totally different. They're going to tell you, well, we don't have time. You're not going to give me money for training, obviously. And unless you give me more people, I, not something I'm going to do. Isn't security your problem? You're the security guy or girl. So the only way to affect this uh, realistically is to go in from the inside of the organization and take existing processes, leverage things like um, ITIL release processes, leverage things like the way people already in your organization build software. You know what that's going to require you to do? That's going to require you to take off the, uh, the super shiny uh, security badge and kind of step off of our high horse for a second and go into the trenches, meet with the developers and say, okay, how do you guys do stuff today? Forget the fact that I just wrote a report that says you're horrible. What do you guys do? How do you release software? How do you write code? What languages do you write in? What's your long-term, short-term strategy? What are the things that drive you? How do you get graded every year for your annual review, performance review? I bet you security is not a metric. So how the heck are we gonna be able to get those developers to change the way they perform if their people, the people that manage them don't care about it? Does that make sense? So this whole idea of having less friction in the organization is really extremely necessary. So we accommodate, align, and associate. What that means is look at the processes that the business is using today. For example, uh, you know, we, we've, we've uh, had this conversation with uh, many organizations and they're trying to improve their software development cycles. I said, well, how does your uh, development organization you know, release software today? Oh, they just, they just sort of, they write it and release it. I'm like, well, I'm pretty sure that's not the case. So you, you look at the developer and go, so what's your release methodology? Well, we use formal, uh, we're doing, we're a waterfall shop. We have six month release cycles and blah, 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 blah. And the security guy goes, really? Or maybe they're agile. And yes, agile does, is kind of evil if you're from a security perspective sometimes because it's a really good excuse not to do security poorly. If you do security poorly as a duct tape and uh, bubble gum approach, right, bolt it on after it's done, agile will absolutely demolish that process and that thinking. Because you can't, there's no place to bolt it onto, it's moving too fast. 
It's like if you've ever seen the, uh, uh, there was a, a sort of one of those very demotivational things that went around a while ago that had to do with people fixing a plane mid-flight. Right? You can't get out, on the, out, of, out onto the plane and change the engine mid-flight. It's just not going to work. Security is not really that much different. You can't change things once it's taken off. So you have to give it time. Uh, align to others' goals. And I, and I mentioned that because, and I'll say it again, it's actually really important. Figure out what your developers are being graded on. If you want them to care about security, make sure they care about security. How? Make sure that their manager management cares about security. But I'm pretty sure it's not going to be, you know, cares about security. Checkbox. Yes. It's how many defects per line of code do you generate? How do you measure that? Well, what's the industry, what's the industry best practice? Don't shoot me. Right? What's, uh, what's the average? What are we shooting for? Let me ask this slightly differently. When we go back, let's go back a couple of steps. Remember that assessment step? We're trying to shoot for what? Do you want, soft, do you want to write software with zero defects? Can you point to one organization that ever has, in spite of the millions and billions of dollars spent on software development? I certainly cannot. So where is the state of good enough? Anybody want to take a stab at who they would go and ask that question from? Risk people. Wait, but risk isn't an IT function. Don't the security guys tell you what's good enough? No, they don't, right? You know, if, if anybody caught my ISSA talk on Thursday, yeah, Thursday, the, the, the whole premise of this is that as security professionals, we don't get to tell the organization what they should and should not do. We should be an advisory body. Based on the last two, step ones and two, right, of this process, we figure out what is your tolerance? What are you okay with? What is the risk organization in your company willing to go to bed at night and feel okay about? That's where we shoot for. Then we take all these processes and take these goals that they've already got and we sprinkle magic security pixie dust in there. But we don't call it that. You can, I mean, you can call it whatever you want. But at the end of the day, if you try to enforce security, you're going to be shooting a moving target. It's never going to work. I know because it's t almost 2012 and it's still not working. I haven't seen any secure software yet. I've seen moderately risk averse, but nothing's been secured. So think of, this is the other thing, think of the full application lifecycle. Any, any of you guys here familiar with the concept of ALM? Application lifecycle management? That's funny, because the one guy back there that raised his hand uh, works at a browser company. I'm glad at least, that, at least that works. But the whole idea of application lifecycle management, and this goes back to process, is where is the, somebody shouted out, where do you think the absolute best place to affect change in a release cycle is? Wait, somebody said it. Before that, thank you. One more time. Requirements. Which which type of requirements? Because there's IT and there's business requirements, right? You guys know that little game? Business requirements, absolutely. Because what ends up happening is, stop me if you've seen, if you've heard this this one. A bunch of people that work in the business get together and decide they're going to want something done. They saw one of their competitor sites now has a cool flash widget. So what do they want? They want a cool flash widget. That is now a business requirement. Access my site via cool flash widget. Okay, IT, go do this. If that's the requirement, you're screwed. Because there's absolutely no way you can put a, uh, an access into something like I'll use an example I've seen before, an ERP front end, right, in an ERP database through Flash can't be done well, at least I haven't seen it. 
So there, there's, there's, you have to be able to affect change much earlier. So you've got requirements, design, build, test, governance at the end, but is that really where it drops off? There's maintain. There's one more thing though. What's after maintain? Death. Like taxes, it's inevitable. And high gas prices. So, gosh, you guys are dead out there today. Whatever. So, absolutely, at some point, that app will go away. The question becomes, does it go away to, you know, at some point today or 25 years after you've retired? I don't know about you, but I've continued to meet apps that were written about the time I was born. I'm pretty sure those people don't work for that company anymore. I'm willing to also bet that nobody around or maybe alive knows what all that spaghetti code does. It's either Fortran or COBOL. Any Fortran or COBOL experts in the room? I'm sorry. It's fun maintaining that code, isn't it? So how does that application go away? There's also one more thing that nobody's mentioned. It's part of the maintenance. Now, after test, there's maintenance, and then there's sunset. In that maintenance phase, there's something that I, we've been talking about all conference. No? Think of the exploitation that we've, every, we've been all talking about here. What happens when that app gets breached? Patching is important, but incident response. How many of you guys, before I just said it now, would consider incident response part of a software development life cycle? I have one hand, two hands, three hands, out of a pretty decent sized room. So, incident response. Uh, somebody said something really interesting to me the other day. They said that when they have an, in, they, they use incident response as a great way to gather requirements. It's kind of fascinating, isn't it? When the app goes kablooey, big time, requirement is going to be that little piece that just went kaboom needs to get fixed. So the patch that is written is a, has some new requirements. You can use that as leverage to make bigger code changes. Now, oddly enough, um, I'll mention this again later, but at some point, we have to decide what we're going to change and how much. Got a great story at OWASP. Swap, you know, we're just swapping war stories about code analysis. And uh, John Stephen from uh, Sigital and I were just sort of chatting. And he says, yeah, you know, at one point, I had somebody uh, tell a client that this code is so well written that after this giant report, it requires an 88% code rewrite. Eighty-eight percent, roughly, code rewrite. Don't we just call that a redesign? Like, if you're modifying eighty-eight, and if you're modifying more than twenty percent of the code, somebody has to make a decision. <laughs> if you're making that much change, it's just a structural change. How many? Anybody ever run into this? Right? We're talking about process where you get into that incident response mode. We have to fix that right now whether it's a security bug or a functional bug or a performance bug, really, and the patch ends up breaking more than it fixes. <laughs> yes, some of the ones that, the people that in here that chuckle have been down this road, and it is not cool. Because then you get an option. You can either back out the fix or try to play fix on fix and hope that the new fix doesn't break more than the last fix or the last one before that. If you get into that vicious loop, it's over. This is where we go back to how well documented is your code? How well does the, stop laughing. <laughs> that you laugh at, great, that wasn't even funny. Um, how, well have you, how well have you made clear what is going on in the application? All right, next step. So implementation and technology. Implement, then automate. Odds are, 
There are not enough of you, even if we decided human cloning was allowed starting tomorrow, to solve or even test the world's applications without serious amounts of automation. How many, what's the largest number of, I'll, I'll, I'll give a, I'll do a, I'll give a pen to somebody who can, who's willing to tell me the big, num, biggest number of apps they have. Anybody want to admit to a big number? <laughs> Liar. Who's got, okay, who's got in your organization more than, more than 10? More than 50? In the organization. More than 100? More than 1,000? More than 1,500? 2,000? <laughs> That's an average. That's like an iPhone. Um, <laughs> all right, if, how, how many, how roughly? Close to 3,000. Anybody want to top that? No, I'm just kidding. Here, hand it. <laughs> Put somebody's eye out to be responsible for that. So implement, implementing strategically the kinds of changes we want requires a couple of things. This is completely counterintuitive, and I only say this from experience because I don't want anybody else to fail this badly. So a couple of lifetimes ago, back when this was uh, still something I, I had no idea about, we're gonna, we're gonna put in, this organization I worked for, I was going to put in a, uh, an application security program. And they said, okay, fine, we're gonna let you do this. Go ahead and give us a plan for what you wanna do. And I fought really hard for what I thought was the right thing to do, the right approach. So if your C-level, your executives said, okay, we're gonna, do, we're gonna build a software security assurance program, we'll let you run it, but you have to pilot it. Where would you guys, where would everybody start? Nobody's volunteering. I'm sorry? See, that's where you're smarter than I was. Yeah, see, that's what happened. I did the same thing. So I was like, you know, I'm going to make a big splash. There is a super critical app that the entire company runs on that's about to, be, that's about to go to design. I'm going to inject all these cool security processes right there. And um, about six months later, somebody showed up in my office and said, what are you doing to us? I went, what do you mean? He's like, we're now six weeks over and a half million dollars over budget. All because this, you know, you're using me as your security SDLC guinea pig. I went, yeah, um, but we're getting closer. He's like, well, you know what? <laughs> your, your project's done. You go back over there. That's a really quick way to get marginalized. So the ultimately counterintuitive thing to do, find the most insignificant, the app nobody cares about, but still has some business impact, right? And enforce and try your SSDLC stuff on that. Because if you're willing to admit that you've succeeded on something the first time through, you're my new hero. I certainly have not. And the problem is if you bail on the first time through on something like this, <laughs> you've just lost all opportunity to ever try it again. <laughs> because what's the reaction to when we break something? First off, it's always bl it's blaming it on security, right? I mean, come on, let's face it. When something happens on the network or slowness, who gets the first call? It's got to be the firewall. Am I right? So when the SDL is over budget and way, way long on delivery, whose fault is it? This new security process these guys are trying to implement, it was never here before. We would have been totally on time if it weren't for these guys. So start small, demonstrate some success, and then if you, if you fail and have to bail on it, it'll create a small ripple, but hopefully nobody major will notice. Right? Try it a couple times and then work your way up the food chain to where things get bigger and bigger and bigger. And probably about two years into it, you're going to basically be ready to jump off that, uh, 
that bridge, right, and go for it with that large enterprise app. But the, you know, when you first start, you have to do whatever it takes to succeed with that pilot. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be horrible. It's going to take a lot of work. You're probably going to do stuff that you, you've never wanted to do. You're probably going to have to go roll up your hands and write some code, do additional testing, sit with people and explain to them why they need to do things that they don't believe you need to do. One of those things that we have problems with as security professionals is people that simply go, I don't get it. Why would I want to do that? I mean, why would anybody want to break this application? All it is is a catalog. If you, ha if you had that problem, raise your hand. It's kind of like an anonymous, uh, uh, you know, Unbelievers Anonymous meeting here, right? We have this problem all the time. And, the, and the, the crazy thing about it is, it is so frustrating. Because we get it. I mean, gosh, how could they not get it? But the greatest part of that whole process is that aha moment where somebody goes, oh, I see. And then they go tell all their developer friends about it. Uh, so once you've succeeded, once you've made that small impact and it's worked, tell everybody you can about it. How awesome it was, how much it saved time, saved money, it prevented, gosh, I don't know, whatever, right? Tell everybody you can about it because the, the thing you're going to want to do is not shove people into it, have them come to you. So that's why I said you have to work really hard on that first, very first one. Uh, and augment, uh, augment and automate with technology. I don't think there's very many people left around today that will, that will try to do everything manually by hand, all the testing, all the requirements and all that thing by hand. There's just too much work to do. And even if we figure out how to do all of that in, in some kind of record time, it still doesn't get us anywhere. If you could go in and test every app you have in your company by tomorrow morning and get all the reports and all the co coverage and all the vulnerabilities, so then what? How long will that take to fix? Weeks? Months? Years? 3,000 apps? Decades? Is it realistic? Right, we gotta figure out what's possible, what's not possible here. So people do not scale well. So we have to figure out how to use technology. But taking the right technology and giving it to the right people is sort of key because you have to be able to say, I'm giving you something that will enable you, that you can use with minimal, the key here is minimal invasiveness. So having to impact somebody as little as possible, particularly developers, because they're so sensitive about delivery timelines. They want to get things out, but sometimes you don't have that kind of time. So your process must produce consistent, repeatable results. Anybody run into this before? Where you've gone and tested an app, whether you've scanned it, source code and analyzed it, pen tested it, whatever, and it's the same app that you tested six months ago, but now things have, you've found new bugs, except that it's in code that hasn't changed. What do you do when, somebody, when the project manager says, what do you mean there's new bugs here? This is not the piece of the code that changed. I don't need you to tell me what's broken here. You already said this was okay. How can it be broken? Worse, what if it's stuff that you already knew should have looked for before? So absolute, absolutely paramount in security is the ability to produce consistent, repeatable results. If you can't do the same thing two, three times in a row, this is why we're developing, the, developing that pen test uh, execution standard, right? One of the main reasons. Consistency of results. What do you mean by whatever? Being able to be repeatable is a great asset because what that means is people develop a trust in you. Not only amongst IT, but among the business organization. If they don't believe in what you're doing, it's not going to get anywhere, I promise. I've you know, got lots of years failing at this. Reduce and remove the burdens from the end users, the developers, the PMs. Make it as painless on them as possible 
to do things right. We talk about the path of least resistance. If it's easier to do the wrong thing than the right thing, no matter how right that right thing is, they're going to do it wrong. If you make it easier to make code more secure than it is to produce crap, it will be, they will make it more secure because it's the easier thing to do. That's one of the beautiful things about being lazy, right? You find the thing that's easiest and you go down that path. All we have to do is figure out how to make that easier path the secure one. All right, finally, measurement and reassessment. I don't care how well you think you've done, how well you've tested, how well you've built, how well you've done requirements, managed, uh, maintained, and sunset an application. If you can't prove that you've done a good job, you've completely failed. More importantly, and I asked this question in our uh, LinkedIn group and had some really interesting answers. If you had 30 seconds in an elevator with your CIO and he or she turned to you and said, how's that software security assurance program going? What would you say? <laughs> and you're fired. Give me more money, probably not a good thing. Because you'd get the question of why. Yeah, that doesn't work. I need it. Hackers are going to eat us. Not going to work. So how do you measure what we do? And basically, we're trying to define something that's undefinable. If you, off the cuff, right? Well, we're trying to figure out how we're going to protect ourselves. How do we prove a negative? How do you prove that, we're, that we didn't get hacked or we're, we, you know, we didn't get broken into all those times that somebody could have broken into us? Risk assessment's a great way to do that. Measuring things against organizational business goals. So one of the things I talked about on Thursday uh, in, the, in the more general talk is how do you map software security goals and align them to business goals? What does the company you work for care about? Really strange question, and I don't know, hopefully everybody in here knows this answer. Anybody feel comfortable? I don't want you to name them. I'm just saying anybody feel, if you feel comfortable, raise your hand, naming the top three board level directives for the company you work for for the next fiscal year. Anybody? Kurt, I know you do. Anybody? That's, no, that, I, that's not it, I promise. Make more money? There's probably, at your company headquarters or in your CEO's office or someplace prominent, there's probably something on the wall that said, our organization strives to dot, dot, dot. When your board or your executives meet, they have goals for the year, right? A, a colleague of mine at a ho that runs a hospital organization from an IT security perspective tells a great story about how he went in and sat in on a board level meeting and they discussed things like in a hospital network, how do, one of the things they care about is this, this metric that measures folks that walk into a trauma unit, there's a certain number of them that are not expected, that are expected to get better, and then there's those that are not. How do you make the number that are expected to make it better by maybe just two percentage points to push them over that national average? So as a challenge, right, if that's a hypothetical situation for all of us, how does building better software, having less vulnerabilities in, in our code, contribute to that? Response time. So what do you, in that elevator, what would you say? You said, you know what? We've been able to help the your IT organization cut response time by building more resilient software, a component of which is security. You're not going to say, we found 3,000 SQL injection volumes and fixed them, because you're going to get this look. The hell is that? And I promise if you use anonymous hasn't hacked us yet, that's not going to work either. There's a couple of things that everybody tends to forget and only failure teaches, uh, and that's these, uh, these four. Planning for disruptive technologies. I don't care if you don't work in this, but cloud computing and the consumerization of IT, the consumer device adoption, does affect your software security program, I promise you, in ways you, we can't even imagine right now. Organizations are looking at the applications they built five years ago, and there's, the CIO hears cloud, 
and they do what we call in the industry a forklift, a migration. They pick it up off of their data center floor and they put it in the cloud and now the cloud application is cloud and is a cloud app. Is it? The answer is easy, right? No, it's really not. It's just a different place to fail. The consumerization of IT, this consumer device, uh, device adoption. I was at the uh, store the other day because we were looking at replacing our washer and dryer and there are internet enabled refrigerators. So, so the, you know, your fridge will tell you, they, they're advertising in, in a very short period of time, your fridge will tell you what you're running out of and make grocery lists for you. And if you're, if you're running a, gro if you work for a grocery store chain, you better believe your company's thinking about how to plug into that. And if you're not planning for that attack vector, think ahead, trust me. Because the version you're putting out today or next month is probably still gonna be there when that little brilliant piece of technology comes to life. How about we become a smarter victim? I already said, everybody forgets about incident response. How many organizations know that they've been a victim? There's always that, that metric that comes out every year, a number of companies that, are, that admit to being data breaches. I'd love to have some way of saying, and the other half of that pie chart doesn't know it yet. How do you know? Incident response, we've gotta have a plan to know when we've been breached, when we've got issues. Guys, the breach is not the end of the world. In fact, it's a really interesting way to help the uh, company realize where priorities are. If you get breached and somebody at your executive level goes, eh, just fix it. I have a, I, I have a stark revelation for you. Security's not that big in the organization. And you're not gonna get a $10 million increase in your budget. Knowing where we're going, right? Knowing where the targets are. Adopting these boardroom requirements, I've already brought this up, it's really, really important. As a security professional in your organization, even if you have no aspirations of ma making a ma being a manager, a C-level, whatever, know what your company does and how it succeeds. If you don't, then you're just playing with toys. If you don't know what the goals are, how do you know what to protect? So, and the absolute last part is what happens after you've been promoted? How well does what you have just built, that's that really well-oiled, really fine-tuned, organizationally infused software security assurance program, will it run after you've been promoted or moved on to a different job? Because that's the legacy you leave. Can somebody, is somebody gonna walk in and have to re, basically redo everything from scratch? It's all about how well it's documented and processed. And remember, folks, if this was easy, we would have gotten it right 10, 12 years ago. We didn't. It's not right today. And so, um, Ryan, wanna come up? So we've got some uh, very interesting artwork. So the requirements were, I'm gonna step, flip back through this really quick. All right, here we go. here's our requirements. So two-story house, garage for three cars, garage right. So, so far all of these, uh, so far all these are correct. How close do these look? You, I'll leave them up here in case anyone wants to take a look at these. I'm gonna go with not really even close. No. Not even close. So how confident do we feel that Five minutes? Cool. How confident do we feel about how well developers are going to be able to work with make it secure as a specification? Not very, right? All right, so let's see. We're going to pick one. Hmm. I'm kind of partial to that one. How about you? Yeah, I'm kind of liking that one also. All right, whoever has this thick stapled one? All right, here. This is, where'd it go? That's for you guys. And we were supposed to have three teams, but now that we have four, I have to come up with another prize. So, yeah, that's really funny. 
I'll let you know when I get one. Um, number two would be, hmm, that one? That one? All right, who's, whose is this one? I do. It says roof for people. You guys can fight amongst this one. Okay. Almost catch. All right. I've got a couple of uh, cool pens if anybody wants them up here. Um, I'm out of rabbit stickers. I apologize. They kind of went fast this year. Um, that's all I have. Anybody have any questions, thoughts, comments? Yes. Small organizations. So, that. Figure out what you're working with. If you have a small company, dozen developers or less, the instinct is to say, well, heck, it's going to be a lot easier, right? I have a lot less people to go beat up. Not necessarily true. But, it also, there's a couple of things that you have to figure out. Um, do you, are you going to be able to do the security part of it yourself? Do you, do, you know, can you impact that directly? Uh, do you have capital? Do you have time? A lot of really small organizations tend to simply outsource the security part and build the security, per the person that's in charge of, you know, software security is really the interface between a partner and the developer organization. That's one way of going. But I, I would, this step, if you're a small company, this step is, is still critical, right? More than, more than ever. Thank you. Thank you. Amazing is one way of putting it. What's that? I couldn't get in. Yeah, it, 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 the uh, demand brought down the infrastructure. They lost all six boxes. Literally, they, we dosed them. Seriously? 300,000 employees all tried to buy one at the same time.